Awesome. Tell us okay. more about Asian statistics in Python. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, let me first introduce myself a little bit. I've, you know, I had some family earns to see to earlier, so I didn't get to properly do that. I'm uh, Charles Lindsay. I'm a, a statistician, kind of classically trained, uh, you know, machine learning and all the data mining stuff like existed when I was in school, but it wasn't, you know, the cutting edge, like you absolutely had to do this. And I've kind of like in industry, I've kind of grown, you know, you know, and see it grow as well. So it's, it's been very exciting uh, to be a statistician right now. Uh, but I'm, I'm technically a data scientist too. Uh, whatever, whatever rules you want to use for how you classify people, but it, it's all good. But today I'm going to talk about uh, what I've been working on at, uh, well, so somewhat what I've been working on uh, for my job. Let's see if I can get to, oh, okay, let me, I've got it on my desktop. And, okay. Navigating, meetup confidence, there we go. Okay. View. Let's see it. Full screen. Full screen. There. Okay. Everybody can see. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I'm a principal data scientist at Aptos, uh, and I'm going to talk about Bayesian statistics with Python. Um, you know, in my example, you don't have to do resampling, and I'm going to explain why you don't have to and how it's really cool. Um, so, you know, first, you know, there are some nice buzzwords we're going to touch on as we go through, uh, you know, what's prior distribution, competence, observed data, posterior, uh, you know, the package PyStan. Um, it's PyStan, you know, I'm actually moving into using TensorFlow probability now anyway. So Stan is kind of becoming a little bit deprecated, but it is still a great tool that people can use. Uh, and PyStan is a good interface for it in Python. Um, and I'm also gonna touch on optimization and how we do simulation within Python as well. Um, so, and now, you know, I'll try and keep things at like a relatively general, high level. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, complicated details that we'll touch on. We won't spend a lot of time on, but, you know, as I go through, please uh, caution me if anyone has any questions. So, cool. And, uh, well, as I was saying, um, we're going to start, you know, just with this, uh, this PDF from PowerPoint, whatever you want to call it. And then, We'll spend a little time in a Jupyter notebook, actually an HTML export of a Jupyter notebook, because I don't want anything, you know, breaking down as I'm doing my presentation. Um, so we're going to do that for some of the details. Then we'll come back to the presentation a little bit too. Uh, but you know, we can spend more time in either as you'll have more questions. So. Okay. So first, uh, we're going to talk about a prior. Um, we're in, you know, statistics in general, we want to use a probabilistic model to study real world, uh, you know, phenomena, real world systems. And um, you're always going to have some level of parameterization in your model uh, that, you know, guides how it works. I mean, you know, that you have to have some abstraction and some rules for those abstraction. Um, and these uh, parameters in the Bayesian framework, parameters like cannibalization, elasticity, your latent ability, you know, you take a test, you know, uh, that doesn't tell you how smart you are, just inside of you tells you how smart you are. Um, but in Bayes, they're all random variables. They aren't fixed. Uh, and, you know, the frequentist paradigm would tell you, no, that's not, 
you know, how you should view it. But, you know, and as we'll see, the Bayesian paradigm has some nice advantages there. And uh, when, you know, we make these assumptions that the random variables, uh, and in, in, in this Bayesian uh, setup, I'm going to assume, you know, they all have proper distributions that we believe in. You know, they're, you know, they're normal, they're Cauchy, et cetera. They're all properly formulated. There's no, you know, oh, my prior is proportional to one over sigma or something like that. Um, that's, you know, you can do modeling with improper priors and things will work fine, but, you know, you're, that, that lets you have, you know, some, you, know, you lose some assumptions and so your method of modeling can be that much harder. Uh, you know, here, you know, we're gonna keep the propers as prior and, you know, I'll show with enough data that's going to let you do modeling very simply and efficiently. Uh, so, you know, they all have proper distributions uh, and, you know, these distributions have their own parameters. You know, where is this parameter elasticity centered? Uh, what's the variance of latent ability? And, you know, a little bit more uh, vague, how confident are we in like a sales type lift? Uh, you know, we're going to touch on exactly what I mean by confidence and how we can uh, get a handle on it. So, so, so Charles, before moving on, yeah. prior, for the people listening who have no statistical knowledge and they come here from Python, uh -huh. uh, in simplest words, prior is what you know or what you see? Well, the prior is what you believe in the first place before you have any data, actually. Thank you. The prior is your most, uh, you know, your most elemental assumptions about your parameters. What you think you know. Yeah, what you think you know. Good. And Good. it's incumbent on the observed data to either uh, convince you otherwise or uh, corroborate your uh, opinion. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I caution that that's not like the absolute, you know, <laughs> correct way to go about it because you might have no ideas about some parameters. It's the um, <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, in this framework, you know, we are, you know, and m m oftentimes people use prior data, prior historical data and informs their uh, prior distribution. So there, you can get some good, you know, justification for your progress. Uh, it doesn't have to be pulled out of thin air. So, um, so at the guts of uh, the analysis I'm talking about here, we're going to use the STAN language and it's a probabilistic programming language for Bayesian statistical inference. So that means you can kind of like formulate a model using STAN very simply. Uh, it's written in C++, so it's very fast. And uh, it allows interfaces with a lot of different languages. Like you don't really do STAN like on its own. You use STAN in combination with other stuff, with other like Python or, you know, uh, you know even Stata where I used to work had like a STAN add-on before Stata added their own Bayesian stuff. Um, you know, and I'm sure there's like SAS interfaces and Julia and other stuff too. So, uh, but the one I'm focusing on is uh, PyStan, uh, which interfaces STAN with Python. And, you know, you specify a STAN model, you know, just like you would in programming language. Uh, you know, you have uh, certain blocks that tell you certain things. And uh, it has a specific parameters block that you can spell out the parameters uh, that you're gonna have a prior for and do some inference on. Um, and here in the example we're looking at, you know, totally abstract, we have a alpha parameter, which is going to be positive or, uh, zero. well, I guess it's gonna be non-zero. Uh, and then a beta parameter, which is just gonna roll over the real line, okay? And then, um, so that's how we uh, talk about, you know, the, how we'd specify a parameter in uh, STAN. And then uh, let's go back a tiny bit to where I talked about, comp mentioned confidence. Um, you know, what we mean by confidence is, you know, your belief. How, because uh, I mean, 
you know, being absolutely certain about something is kind of a nice philosophical uh, question. You're all, you know, like with anything, uh, even like science, you know, hardcore science, like you're, you know, your, your experimental evidence just corroborates a theory. Not, nothing is actually like proven. Uh, and so confidence is kind of our way to give uh, some, you know, to talk about that, that feeling that you have that your answer is right and you should act on it, you know, assuming it's correct. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, that feeling is, you know, that describing it was kind of vague. So exactly how you measure it is vague as well. Um, you know, let's look at an example where we're just measuring basically by variance. Um, you know, here we have two normal random variables, x1 and x2. They're both uh, centered at zero and x1 has variance one and x2 has variance none. So we just say, you know, this is kind of just the statistics language X1 is distributed as normal zero one, X2 is distributed as normal zero. So here's a histogram for them. And we see that uh, X1 is much more tightly concentrated around zero than X2 is, you know, just because the variance is bigger. So we would have more confidence that X1 is close to zero than X2 is close to zero. Okay. And so that, that was fairly obvious, but you know, just that decision, you're just comparing two things together. If, you, if I just gave you like X2 has variance nine, you wouldn't necessarily really know what to do with that. It's kind of subjective because variance is just going to be like some positive number. So it's useful for confidence to map it to some like first to constrain range and then, you know, talk about it as a probability, a chance of something happening. And probabilities are going to be between zero and one. And, uh, you know, we can link them together with, uh, you know, with our parameter easily uh, by getting, giving a particular interval. I mean, there's other stuff you could do. You could do tests and, you know, posterior probabilities and stuff like that. But right now, you know, we'll just focus on the interval. So you can formulate something where you can get a lower bound and an upper bound, and you're going to believe that there's a one minus alpha probability that your parameter is in that bound. And, you know, it's directly related to the variance too, as you, you know, increase the variance, of course, the bound's going to get bigger. Um, and, you know, it, it's where invasion, we, you know, really talked about this as being a credible interval, but, you know, really it's how you'd want a confidence interval to actually really be interpretable. Uh, not this repeated sampling stuff that the frequent is talking about for it. So, um, so that, that's kind of where, you know, where I'm talking like measuring confidence at this point, you know, give me a probability and give me an interval around that probability. So, so before we lose our very, very uh, novice people, uh, I, I would throw a question at you and tell me how far I am. Uh -huh. So uh, if in Star Trek you see uh, uh, seven of nine says there is a probability of one in 1,000 of us running into this planet. This is yeah. a confidence? Or a little bit Well, different? if there's probably one in 1,000, I would say that's not very confident that we're going to run into that planet. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So but if there's a probability the of 900 out of 1,000 that we're going to run into that planet, I would think about doing something different. <laughs> so this is what you mean by confidence for the people who don't go into the map. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, that <laughs> probability 7 of 9 was quoting, you know, would directly plug in here, essentially. Yeah. Cool. All right, so, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, parameters and confidence. So, but that's all like, you know, abstract in our head before we actually see any data, before we have run a study, before we've like read the data, you know, before we've seen anything real. And, you know, the parameters are going to parameter, parameterize 
the population that we get the observed data from. Uh, we're going to sample it randomly or, you know, like with some other, you know, uh, you know we, we could run an experiment or we could just see somebody already ran an experiment and look at what they got, uh, you know, without knowing exactly how the uh, numbers were drawn or whatever. But regardless, uh, the parameters are going to tell us about uh, the population, how it's been generated. Um, for example, we have a parameter mu with this prior distribution, and then we're going to observe data like, you know, sample of size n from, uh, you know, condition on mu. Like mu is the, mu is the mean of the uh, data we observe, for example. Um, and, you know, it could be like mu is like your mean, uh, I'm trying to think of something that's not so abstract. <laughs> mu is your uh, mean, uh, your mean weight. And then we observe humans at different weights. You know, it could be, you know, could be anything. And when we observe that data, when we have that real world data, that's going to give us more information about the parameters that uh, than we had originally in the prior distribution. Because I mean, we have this conditional right here, normal mu given one, uh, more normal mu uh, variance one. That's going to tell us some information about mu, not necessarily like extra samples of mu, but it's going to give us some extra information about it. And so when we use that information about the parameters, from the observed data, we're going to formulate a posterior distribution for the original parameters. So the prior was before we observed anything, the posterior is after we've observed, observed things. So, okay. And uh, in STAN, uh, we specify the observed data in a data block. Uh, N is just, you know, in our trivial example, N is basically just our sample size. And we're gonna observe uh, N samples of uh, the variable X and we're gonna observe N samples of the variable Y. And we'll see in a little bit exactly how those are formulated. And uh, so now we'll talk a little bit about the posterior density. You know, I mentioned like random variables, distribution, et cetera. Um, the, the distribution is kind of like how you would do probabilities for, you know, like something happening with the parameter, what, what the range is, et cetera. Um, but how you'd really do calculations, uh, you know, on that distribution, you're going to do it in terms of the density. It's kind of like the, uh, it's basically kind of the probability at a point. Um, and so you'd like, integrate it or sum it up to actually get a probability. But it's kind of the neat, uh, straightforward way to do calculations where you can actually make some, uh, you know, push, you make some, uh, uh, you know, probabilistic statements at the end. You start with the density and you formulate everything based on the density. Um, so, so, so give the example with weight. Like you, you gave weight yeah. before. So what's the density, for example, of weight so people understand? Well, you could talk about, uh, you know, and as we'll do much here, you'd say, okay, the weight, uh, well, I wouldn't, uh, well, I, I guess weight would be a little bit skewed. So I wouldn't say it's a normal density. I'd say it's like a chi-square density or whatever. Um, and then you just, uh, you would observe people with that, uh, you know, like, like an individual's weight, you know, is a chi-squared random variable, which has this density, um, you know, and you, you calculate probabilities based on that by like integrating that density. So okay. that's still a little bit esoteric, but the density, well, the density is kind of like the elemental math part that lets you, uh, you know, you can kind of like stretch it out and say something probabilistic about, um, about uh, you can say something probabilistic about uh, your random variable once you stretch it out. But you've got, it, you've got to start with that density in the first place. It's kind of the most elemental piece of the model. Okay. Yeah. 
And then, um, so we have, uh, we're just gonna use pi for, you know, kind of the density function. Pi of theta is the power density, the parameters of uh, theta. And we're gonna talk about pi of theta given x as the posterior density of the parameters theta. Um, so that's the density of theta conditional on the observed data x. So we talked about seeing uh, the observed data condition on the, pro uh, the parameters earlier. Now we're going to flip that. Um, and then we're gonna use that, that posterior density to get you know, updated information about the parameters. Uh, where are they centered at? How confident are we that they're close to that, those centered values, et cetera? Um, and then, you know, classically, um, you know, you wouldn't, you, if you don't make a lot of assumptions, you'd start, you'd start with the density or you'd start with the density, uh, the posterior density that's maybe like proportional to something. Um, and then you would use simulation based methods to come up with the posterior distribution based on that density. You would, uh, you know, use Markov chain, Monte Carlo, stuff like that. And that's, that's great, um, but it's very computationally intensive and uh, your interpretation can be harder too because you have to go back to whatever you, you know, whatever you simulated. It's not, uh, you're, you know, using simulation, you know, like a Monte Carlo method, is not the most, um, uh, and uh, it's it's not the most intuitive thing. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, just seeing it in the abstract. Whereas, you know, when you're actually, you know, have the full density, you know, you can treat it the same way as you would, uh, you know, knowing everything. You just you integrate it out or say, oh, I know this is the mean, et cetera. You'd be able to get nice close forms from all these things. Um, and then, but that's, being able to do that is dependent on you having enough data and also dependent on you having, you know, strong, uh, you, know, uh, you know, proper priors. You are making some assumptions about the parameters in the first place. And you also have enough data that you can use uh, this, these uh, rules to go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, do, do things uh, appropriately. So um, we, uh, you know, we're gonna use numeric optimization uh, to estimate the central values of the parameters and their confidence. Uh, we're gonna get into that a little bit more in a minute. But again, it's all dependent on you having these nice assumptions of having enough data and having everything be proper. So, so Charles, before you run, uh, run away with this, is it uh -huh. for simple people, I'll, I'll say a simple thing. Yeah, uh, absolutely, you absolutely. Me, and you correct me. So uh -huh. basically you are telling us that uh, here, the, the posterior density that you're describing is the, the, the situation like, you know, the average weight in the population and that population, yeah. let's say 150 pounds. Yeah. But the posterior, knowing that this is the, now you ask the question, knowing that this is 150, uh, 150 pounds, the average, how does it look like? What's the chance of someone having 140 pounds? Am I correct? Yes. Yes. So this yeah. is what. what what's I'm the saying? chance of somebody having 140 pounds based on these individuals I've sampled as well? Perfect. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I'm, I'm exactly. Those, those are the types of questions down. we'll be able to answer. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. So um, uh, the likelihood of the observed data is that, that's kind of uh, it, it's kind of like almost a Bayesian thing that the frequentists have used. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit sneakily worded because we are looking at you know theta given x, but they they aren't interpreting it uh, necessarily as you know that probability. It's really just the uh, flip density of x given theta. So like in the example earlier, well, with like the weight we knew, or we're assuming, okay, it's chi-squared with, you know, uh, parameter uh, theta. 
previously. Yeah. And then, um, so the posterior density is gonna be proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior density, this right here. And we know pi of theta totally, and we know the likelihood totally as well. Um, and then uh, we, you know, this stuff can also be specified in STAN very easily too. And let's, you know, I've got, you've got a model statement, a model block. And then here we're specifying the prior as being chi squared four uh, for alpha and uh, the prior for beta being normal one, one. Uh, so normal with mean of one and variance of one. And then the likelihood is basically specifying this nice regression relationship between y and x. So y is uh, alpha plus beta times x. Uh, it, it's, it has, it's normal with that mean and a variance of one. Uh, so, it, you know, we'll see uh, as we observe, uh, you know, observe a sample, basically alpha and beta are sampled once for every set of real world data we have. And then we just generate Y based on this. Uh, you know, so like Y is generated from X in this manner. So X is really, you know, just totally um, kind of, well, it's kind of like in, uh, independent and exogenous of the parameters. You can totally, you know, just totally condition on X. But to know about Y's distribution, you need to, you know, take X and alpha and beta into account. So, 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 so you, before, you, uh -huh. before you run away, let's assume uh -huh. alpha is the weight and beta is, let's say, the age. Then Y may be something like the, uh, the chance of getting COVID according yes, to- Yes, yes, rate. yes, yes. I mean, that's the, the well, I mean, that, that it, it's, that, that's a silly example, but that sort of, that mechanism ex is exactly what's happening. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that, that, you know, like that, that an interpretation like that is exactly the right interpretation. Um, but, you know, like weight and age, you know, getting COVID is, is directly uh, as the, the, the formulas aren't as simple as that. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. But I, I get what you're saying. I'm, I'm giving the yeah. concept so people understand what are the equations. Exactly. The exactly. Equation. Exactly. Perfect, perfect. And uh, you know, you take the prior and the likelihood together, and you get the posterior. So that's the easy way you specify it in Stan. And then you know, this is how you specify it in Pi Stan. Uh, you know, model you know is just a string, and then you pass it into the Stan model constructor. Uh, very straightforward. And I I added like a suppressed standard output thing here because uh, Stan can give you a lot of uh, extra information you might you, you'd want to know that if your model went wrong but if your model's great you 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 don't care so uh, but anyway that's how you specify it in Pi Stan and so let's see um, so you know let's get a little bit more into the guts uh, we want to maximize posterior density with respect to theta so we're going to maximize that likelihood and prior uh, uh, product. And uh, you know, for numerical stability, we'll just look at the natural logarithm. Uh, so we look at the log posterior. And so the maximum is going to be the posterior mode, uh, which is the point in the parameter space with the highest posterior density. So that's like the point with the highest probability, basically. Um, and it's going to be a good point estimate, uh, especially in like uh, distributions like we saw earlier. Like the highest probability matches like the center of the distribution. There are some places where that won't be, you know, the interpretation won't be as good, uh, but it's still like a useful point estimate to give someone. Uh, you know, like, you know, I'm most believing that it's going to mean that right at this point. Um, and to get that, we use uh, Newton or quasi-Newton uh, numerical maximization. Uh, you know, here I use Newton, but 
you know, in practice, it's good to use L LBFGS or something like that. Um, and I'm Broyden. I'm 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 bad with some of the acronyms. I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, but so that's how you do the optimization uh, in PySAN. You just pass it in SM dot optimizing. Very straightforward. And then um, and then uh, so. Here, let's get into a little bit more of the guts, uh, but I don't want to get too deep into this because it'll just get complicated for us. But at the posterior mode estimate, uh, we're going to be able to approximate it with this quadratic equation. Uh, S of theta is the score function, and that's the derivative of the log posterior uh, with respect to theta. And H of theta is the second derivative of the log posterior. And uh, you know, when we get to uh, theta being equal to theta hat, and then, you know, let me say too, this is a Taylor approximation of theta about theta hat. But you can see when theta gets close to theta hat, this linear term right here is going to be zero because theta is going to be equal to theta hat. So that's just going to vanish. And then, um, so w when we're at that point, and uh, we can do an exponentiation, take it out of the log, then we're gonna see that pi of theta given x is proportional to this, which is just an exponential quadratic. So that means that the posterior is gonna be approximately proportional to multivariate normal density. So, and we know everything about the multivariate normal density. Uh, so it'll be easy to get variances from it, uh, and this is, again, is the Hessian, uh, the, the inverse Hessian, I'm sorry, uh, which is the inverse of the second derivative um, of the log post year. So you can get variances from it, means, et cetera. And then getting the confidence intervals is gonna be pretty easy too, because we can just use the normal quantiles. So that's kind of the big theoretical setup we get to. Um, and then, you know, kind of the interesting part we get here, pi stand won't give the Hessian to us. Uh, we can get it ourselves using numerical differentiation. Um, so that's kind of the neat part of it. And let's, um, let me briefly go to the uh, notebook that I've set up. Uh, I think it's here. Yeah, here we go. So this is um, th this is an HTML file of a Jupyter notebook, and I'm letting uh, I I'm going to give access to the Jupyter notebook and stuff as well too. I've got a um, uh, uh, I've, I've got a uh, you know an actual package that you can just download and run the uh, notebook at the end. Uh, so I'll 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 be glad to show you all around that a little bit of that too. Um, uh, second, anyway, yeah. here's the HTML. Uh -huh. uh, one second, I see red lines yeah. on my screen. Is it something that you generated? Yeah, I, I don't know what happened there. Okay. I'm curious what it is. It's like- uh, Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm getting the same thing. Yeah. yeah, okay. There you go. Okay, awesome, awesome, cool. So. But I, 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 nothing was really obscured, so. Um, but yeah, this notebook goes into a lot more detail um, and even gets into how you do uh, parameter constraints and stuff like that, you know, using the Delta method and stuff. So there's a lot of good information here. Um, so, but, you know, to get the Hessian, if it's not given to you, uh, you know, as long as you can calculate the gradient, you can do it numerically. Um, so this is a this is the definition of a derivative, right? Uh, you know, you do a little change in your parameter, uh, and then you get the uh, you know, you look at the difference of your density as you change from you know a one value of the parameter to a very close other value of the parameter, and you let that you know, the, the difference go to zero and that's your definition of a derivative. And, you know, numerically, you just 
you know, uh, put in, you know, make small values and uh, your parameter change and you, you just compute the difference. Uh, and in our case, we, you know, there are, you know, much more details uh, where you go in and, uh, you know, like deciding what your bandwidth is for computing, et cetera. But essentially what we're doing, going to do is um, we're going to go, uh, let's see. Yeah, we're going to go scale to the left and scale to the right, compute the gradient, and then just divide, can, compute the gradient in both those places, and then just divide by two times the scale. And then that's our uh, derivative, basically. And, you know, we're doing that parameter by parameter. So we're doing the partial derivative of the gradient with respect to each parameter at a time. And then, you know, getting those all together, that gives you the hashing matrix. Um, so I went ahead a little bit, you know, this is a, uh, this estimate map uh, function will, uh, you know, will perform optimization in our example, and it will also do uh, the numeric uh, differentiation stuff too. Um, PyStan, you know, like you have to do a little bit of extra stuff to set it up so that it can take your gradient for you. This test grad fit, uh, you know, you, you, once you've done your model, you, you know, do a sampling of just like one observation so you can set it up and then calculate the gradient. So that's what's happening, this sm.sampling done on the stand model object. We did optimizing first to get the answer, uh, to get our point estimate. Then we do sampling to set it up so we can do the gradient. So, so and that's what this grad log prob is giving us. So basically we're just, to get the Hessian, we're just looping over each of the parameters, computing the uh, computing the great the uh, numeric derivatives, and then populating the hash. There's a little bit more here where we're uh, you know we did the delta method stuff, which is just for transform parameters, which we won't get into, but it's all here. And then um, so that's like how you would uh, use PyStan to. Uh, you know, get your point estimates, and then how you would uh, get your variance at the end. And then, uh, uh -huh. so let, let, let me ask something to simplify it to the people who never, uh -huh. uh, who don't have the math capabilities, maybe. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, uh, you are basically trying to find out, you are on the landscapes down somewhere in the terrain, and you are trying to find optimization means finding the lowest value, correct? something like that. And you are- Well, in our case, optimization would be finding the highest value. But right. I mean, the way you would- uh, The, the way you would actually perform the optimization, you would be looking for the lowest value. You would look at the negative log likely. Good, so, so the way you're gonna look at it, you're gonna try to find the highest hill. And the way to go yeah. about it is where you stand, you're gonna go a step to the right and a step to, and then a step to the left and then see whether your slope is going up and down, and then you're going to change your position such that you will be going up. Well, yeah, that, that's how that's how the uh, new, the quasi Newton algorithm is behaving. Yeah, you know, it's using that derivative information and then even some approximation of the second derivative to see where it needs to go, basically. Yeah. So um, the gradient. But, but what we're computing slope, right correct? here is we've already got to the maximum and we're just trying to figure out what that full second derivative is. So okay. that's what's happening here. Okay. Yeah. So you're trying to change, to find not the slope, is how, fa how fast the slope changes. Yes, exactly. Because you're looking at the second derivative. Words. So you're looking at how fast the slope changes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to correspond with how variant your you know, your, your answers are, how variant your uh, parameters are, basically. Perfect, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so that's how this is kind of set up. And then let me touch a little bit on uh, confidence intervals before we get into the simulation part. Um, I do a little bit more of a breakdown here as to how you would get a confidence interval. You know, you just set up the equation and then you center everything. Uh, you take out the posterior mode and you divide by the standard deviation. 
And then that leaves you with, you know, this parameter uh, without the mode and then divided by the standard deviation. That's gonna just be standard normal. And then you can just use the normal quantiles. So then you re just reformulate everything. And then these are your confidence intervals. Uh, and, you know, you can just use scipy.stats to get those quantiles once you have them. So um, now, now let me get into the simulation a little bit. Um, so, you know, we talked about, you know, I kind of like showed you the, the tools that we use to fit things. Um, so let, let's kind of put it all together. Um, you know, we you know, specify our pi stand model or, you know, like that we talked about before with the regression. And then uh, also let me show you this. This function is for actually drawing a uh, random sample basically. You know, first you get one observation from your beta and your alpha. And I, I'm using uh, just, uh, uh, you know, NumPy stuff here, like the randomization tools within NumPy. Uh, this RS is, got it here somewhere, um, should have it. Speed stats. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, okay. RS is being passed in as random state, basically, which you're getting from NumPy slash SciPy. And then you're drawing a, you know, an observation of beta and observation from alpha from it. And then you're going to draw, uh, here we're just saying X is normal, uh, you know, in X's, uh, you know, standard normal in X's. And then uh, we're gonna generate Y is alpha plus beta times X. And um, we're going to, you know, so that's the mean of y, and then we're going to let a y be normally distributed about that mean of y. And then we'll have our data, just a nice, easy dictionary. Um, so that's how we draw an observation. And then um, now let me go back briefly to the PowerPoint. We're going to talk about the simulation we're going to run uh, that kind of like shows how everything puts together, you know, is put together and also how you know, we can see the theory actually work. Okay. Oh. Okay. So uh, we're going to sample 1,000 draws of our parameters alpha and beta from their prior distribution. Uh, and at each prior draw, we're going to sample uh, n equals 600 of the observed data variables x and y. Okay. So that's 600 times 1,000 basically cases. Um, and we're going to check the posterior distributions, whether they're normal or not, uh, with, you know, with the means of the posterior modes and the variances by the inverse session. Um, we're going to check that by using, uh, by comparing against some resampling methods, because we can use the sampling uh, tool within PyStan to just run some MCMC draws. And we can like see what the empirical, the, uh, you know, the post the empirical posterior distribution, we're going to see how well that matches with uh, what our theoretical one is, you know, that we've made our assumptions about. Um, so we're going to use 500, L equals 500 posterior samples for each, uh, you know, uh, for each simulation draw that we have. Okay, so that that's the setup. We're going to use uh, uh, simulation to show basically everything you know, and our theory is correct in, so, in this so, example. So in this simple example, let's put it in age and weight because people will be able to uh, relate to this. So basically you are drawing yeah. a thousand people for, with the age and weight initially. This is your first step. Well, Later, we're drawing a thousand uh, parameters of, uh, so we're drawing a thousand weights, prior weights. Okay. And then for each of those thousand prior weights, we're going to draw 600 people that are centered at those weights. Thank you. Yeah. And then later you're going to go and sample them once more for the MCMC, but this is when you're doing something. Well, like yeah, that's going to be the, uh, the resampling that we're going to do. Uh, 
which is basically like we're, um, we're, we're kind of, um, well, we, it's essentially like we are drawing from the true posterior distribution without making any extra assumptions. But we're doing it just based on, uh, you know, the, the sample that we've seen. So it's the, uh, you know, the fact that MCMC and stuff actually works, uh, we're, we're going to depend on that to corroborate, you know, our answers. So our answers are going to be only as good as MCMC, basically. But we're, we will have checked things basically in two different ways, so that's going to corroborate that we're correct. Okay, well, let's see. Yeah. Cool. All right, so, and I keep forgetting what window I'm in. And we're trying to see that those are normal distributions. This is what we're yes, trying to Yes, see. that's our assumption. So hopefully we'll be corroborated. Uh, and I, in the simulation, I also did another parameter, S of alpha beta, which is alpha plus beta. And uh, that's kind of overkill, but it helps us make sure, uh, well, okay. So, you know, I mentioned that, you know, the posterior is multivariate normal. So we can't just check each of the uh, individual distributions, check if they're normal, uh, because you know we might have missed that interaction between the two. You know, it's multivariate normal, so there's some correlation potentially between the two, and they need to behave in the, the correct way. So that's why I added this extra parameter that actually uses both alpha plus beta, you know, because it's going to depend on. Uh, the variance of alpha and the variance of beta and the covariance of alpha and beta. So it kind of like helps us see that, okay, they're individually okay and together they're okay too. Okay. Um, so if everything's correct, we should have these distributional assumptions met. Alpha minus the posterior mode divided by the standard deviation. It, you know, same thing with beta, same thing with, you yeah. know. So they, those should all be standard normal zero one. And we're going to be able to test that using, um, you know, the Anderson Darling test, which is a statistical test for uh, normality. And, uh, you know, we're going to, we'll store whether it rejects at the uh, 0.05 level. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll you know, the, the, the significance level is kind of like tied to the confidence interval a little bit. We just look at it uh, rather than having like, okay, I'm 95% confident, I'm saying, oh, I'm only 5% only of the time would I like to be wrong. That's a very rough way of looking at it, but that's kind of the intuition. Um, so, and you know, a little more details, how we get the confidence rules, et cetera. Um, so this is uh, going to take us, this right here, this function right here is going to, um, you know, kind of, uh, it will take uh, a sample, basically what every one of the uh, draw samples it will work on, uh, you know, with L, you know, it will take the observed data uh, and they, our posterior mode and our uh, covariance estimate, you know, the, the inverse Hessian and uh, the number of posterior draws we want to do. Uh, and then it will perform Kind of like give all our statistics for that, for that, for those that that draw basically, um, and you know there's you know the, this is how the the resampling is done, you know we're just doing the stand the pi stand sampling here we are just doing one observation we're using like three thousand MCMC draws with a warm up of one thousand uh, stuff like that you know and there's some stuff like uh, that you know like you can't just do a bunch of MCMC draws, uh, you know, and accept them all because they're going to be correlated. So you might need to like do some thinning and stuff like that. So this is kind of like, uh, you know, like, okay, if you need more samples effectively than you actually got, then you need to do, uh, you know, like a, you know, another big one, you know, again, that's kind of in the weeds, uh, you know, the, the notebook would have some more information about that. Um, but then you do you do that, and then you get data extracted, um, and then there's some stuff like where we're, you know, uh, running the Anderson Darling test that's stored. You know, so, some of these 
details, you know, like, you know, you can just look deeper in the notebook and see, uh, you know, and then, you know, like the form, you know, now we're getting into forming the confidence intervals, you know, just the, the square root of the standard deviation and mode, uh, you know, this Z025 is just the normal quantiles, you know, pretty straightforward stuff, but, you know, kind of tedious and then the weeds. Uh, so then, you know, with all that formulated, uh, you know, we're going to look at the results. We're going to run the simulation. We're going to run the simulation using this function. Uh, you know, again, observe data, sample of size n equal 100, uh, 600 for each of the uh, 1,000 prior draws. And at each observed data sample, we're going to look at uh, 500 posterior draws to see, you know, like that, 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 the, that our assumptions are met. Uh, so we just run it and then, you know, estimate the map. And then we do all the, the stuff to kind of record the results and posterior results we we're just talking about. And then uh, you just store all the information in our uh, results, uh, you know, results matrix of, of from doing our uh, simulation. And let me point out too, it's important when you do simulation that you always, uh, you know, you, you, you set the state of the simulation, you know, uh, to be, fixed. Like you don't just draw a random number. You draw a random number with this seed from this starting place. And the np.random or numpy random, uh, you know, functions allow you to do that. You set a, I'm setting random state uh, with seed 218409. And so whenever I run this notebook, I'm going to get exactly the same results because I've done this. It's fully going to be fully deterministic in a way, um, but I mean, still, you know, from our perspective, it's totally random, but it's reconstructable random. It's replicatable random. So, uh, so do all that, set it all up, and then we run the simulation. And I'm just printing out what observation number we're at as we, you know, do the uh, 1,000 draws, and, and you know, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it's straightforward because I've suppressed the output actually, but uh, <laughs> generally there aren't any problems. Uh, and we'll be able to see in the results if there are problems too. So, but, you know, is everybody kind of following where we're at? We're just going to look at the results now from running our big simulation. That's a very good good point. Um, so yeah, it's uh, David Hirsch had a very good point in the, the uh, chat. You know, uh, it's essentially um, well, uh, it's you know they're called like pseudo random numbers, basically. Like from our perspective, they are basically random. We can just you know uh, they're random that we know how to generate. Uh, if we want truly random, you know, there's some stuff like where you could use like solar flares or something like that. Um, but you wouldn't want to do that with your simulation because you'd want to be able to rerun your simulation to make sure that everything behaved like it should. Um, you so, want to be deterministic. Exactly, exactly. And moreover, we want it to be replicatable so yeah. that it's... Uh, Kind of like incontrovertible that this is the way it works. If it's not replicatable, you know, there's no real reason to believe your results uh, because you, you know, nobody knows. Uh, but if you can replicate it, anybody can just replicate it and everything's fine. Uh, so, you know, that that's how good science should be. Uh, yes, absolutely. There's, <laughs> and uh, many scientists don't follow this so well, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, well, th there's all the, one of the biggest problems though, like above, like using a random number, uh, seed 
properly is people just don't keep track of their data very well. And, you know, like what, what programs they use can be a little bit flaky. But the big thing is like, you know, like uh, being able to get people's data and see precisely what they did. So, but that, that's, you know, uh, the problem here, everything's abstract and perfectly simulated. So, um, so now let's look at the results from our simulation of 1000 draws. Uh, so we have alpha mode and alpha mean posterior. This posterior is what we got from our, um, uh, you know, the posterior draw thing that we did. Um, so that the kind of like the, the double corroboration by using MCMC to compare to what we got from the optimization. Um, so this is what the mean posterior and stuff would be. Uh, and then our, uh, so we see alpha mode matches uh, mean posterior and also the standard deviation match pretty well too. Um, and the same thing with the alpha SD posterior, uh, beta mode, beta posterior, same thing. Uh, the sum mode, which was that extra parameter we talked about, uh, you know, alpha plus beta, that matches too, everything's good. And then, uh, you know, same thing with standard error. And then the uh, rejection rates, the Anderson Darling, uh, we see those are 0.05. And then, you know, the same thing for, for alpha, beta, and the sum. And then our proportion, uh, which is, so we looked at the proportion, uh, might not have shown that as well, uh, but we looked for whether um, alpha and beta were in the confidence interval. Uh, we should have something like that. Syntax. Yeah, prop alpha. Yeah, so that, that's, this is the um, proportion that the uh, posterior alpha is within the uh, confidence interval that we got from our, um, just from the posterior mode and variance and the normal rules. And so that matched 95% as well. Uh, so like our point estimates, you know, for everything, you know, like, you know, point estimate for the mode, variance, et cetera. That seems to all match perfectly. Um, and then to check kind of like the probabilities, what we'd uh, do is, uh, you know, we would do a hypothesis test of whether the rejection rate, you know, like a 0.05 uh, is in the confidence interval for the proportion. And then uh, we do the same thing for the 0.95. And we would just use, um, there's this uh, proportion, she's probably doing like uh, Klopper Pearson or something like that, uh, you know, uh, proportion test that, uh, you know, uh, stats models does. I think that's the first time I've talked about stat mo stats models here. Let me, let me give a enthusiastic plug for that program as well. Um, you know, PyStan and Stan are great for Bayes. Stats model is, is great for uh, just general statistics. Um, you know, even doing generalized method of moments and maximum likelihood, all that stuff. Um, and so, and I'm able to use it here to do this proportion test. And so it's going to give me a, a confidence interval for each of the proportions. And we're going to see that 0.05 is in each of these Anderson Darling uh, proportions. Uh, you know, the confidence intervals and then the uh, confidence interval proportions all contain 0.95 as well. So this, you know, corroborates that our theory works, that our asymptotic approximation is fine in this case. So it um, means that- So, and it, you know, in the process, we have shown you how you can do simulation in uh, Python as well. So, so in simple words, it means that the weights and uh, uh, the weights and ages that we, we talked about before were actually normal in simple words, and you tested it using multiple methods. Well, right? the posterior is no, the posterior distribution is normal because we have enough data. We've moved from the prior distributions being chi squared or whatever to the posterior distribution being normal. Because we have enough data 
that we don't need, we aren't concerned with the, you know, the, the, uh, the unsymmetry, the skewness, whatever in the prior, that's just totally overwhelmed by us having enough data. Um, so we made the distribution normal, but still the mean and the variance, uh, that, that's really what's, you know, shifting the distribution around. Uh, and that's kind of like the, the information we really gain by doing this. You know, we just gain information about the center and the variance and, and the confidence in our, uh, you know, in, in being close to that center value. Uh, so the approximation actually, just takes care of the extra stuff about the distribution, basically. So we actually have more information, not only to tell about the shape of distribution, but also some of the parameters. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. And um, let's see. So that's pretty much, I think I've touched on everything. Um, and uh, so thank you all for listening to all of it. I mean, I mentioned earlier that I was, I believe I mentioned earlier, I'm moving from PyStan to, uh, or I've already moved doing this from PyStan to TensorFlow Probability. Uh, and TensorFlow probability will actually give you uh, the Hessian as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I found that could actually be uh, computationally intensive to compute that Hessian. So sometimes it could be better to just take the numeric derivatives anyway. Um, but, you know, it's, it's good to know, you know, anyway, how to do approximations, uh, you know, distributional approximations and also just functional approximations. Because uh, you never know when you're going to, you know, not, uh, you know, not be able to burn out lots of processing power, that sort of thing. It's always good to have flexibility. I, I guess we have to thank you. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Charles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. And um, let, let me... Um, so I almost forgot it, but the, uh, I'm going to have a package to go with this. Uh, so do, do you have this uh, like on uh, GitHub or someplace where can people can? Well, I, I can put it somewhere, certainly. Um, yeah. It, really, this is just a, um, uh, this is just a uh, package that you'd be able to run to uh, uh, just set up the notebook so you could play around with it. Um, you know, it's got like, uh, you know, stuff to set up your virtual environment. Uh, and then this might be kind of useful for people to have uh, just so they, you know, if they have some trouble doing their own package and stuff too. Um, but I'd, I'd be glad to put that up somewhere. Uh, I didn't know if we had like a dedicated, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Python meetup thing or I could just, you know, create a GitHub for it. So. Just create a GitHub for it and send it to Flo and he'll make sure that it's yeah, reaches it. Awesome. Cool, cool. cool. That's good. So, yeah. Okay. I, I have a question about the TensorFlow uh -huh. probability. Uh, I, uh, so TensorFlow probability is something I never heard about. I, I used TensorFlow. I never saw you as a TensorFlow probability. What can it do? Well, so TensorFlow probability is... Uh, PyMC has moved to PyMC4, which is built on TensorFlow probability. And then um, let's see if I can find. I've got some notebooks I've done on TensorFlow probability, but those are still wrapped up in a lot of uh, Aptos slash Revionic stuff. Just tell us what this does. It's like, does, does it do the same thing as TensorFlow? Like, can it run on GPU? Can it do all this stuff? Yes, like yes. It is. A TensorFlow probability is enabled to do all the stuff TensorFlow does. And you can basically do TensorFlow, you know, it's essentially interchangeable. I mean, the TensorFlow was built a lot for like neural networks and stuff like that and deep learning. TensorFlow probability is relaxing some of that into doing, you know, parametric uh, statistics. And then, um, but you can do, you know, like, you know, uh, let's see, distributions. I mean, you can do 
you know, like so many distributions are defined. It's, uh, let me see if I can get to TensorFlow probability distribution. And they've got a nice yeah, TFP distributions. And then, you know, you could set up all the Bayesian stuff too, if you want to run MCMC or whatever, but they've got like uh, nice beta, it would load, I'm sorry. So you, can um, sample, so you can sample from those distributions. Yes, yes, you can sample. Um, and then uh, what I found, if you do, uh, so, so, some of the way of like treating each distributional step as a graph, uh, I could I found that to be fairly slow. Um, and I mean, it might be like, I know with TensorFlow, there's all sorts of like, whether you're doing it eager, or, you know, graph distribution and some of that, like, you know, the difficulties that I've encountered might be due to that. I've got, you know, you know variations where I'm doing both. But all, what I found is when you um, uh, to, to, to actually do like uh, you, you can have like separate uh, graph parts to do, um, you know, like your, you know, like your individual distributions you're starting with your, for your parameters. But when you actually do like when you formulate your posterior, you don't want to do each of those pieces in, in their own graph. You want to do that all together in one function, basically. Um, and there's actually, uh, I think it was a stan to TensorFlow probability. Uh, yeah, stan to TFP. This is a good uh, tool to use, uh, you know, if you are starting from stan, and then you can get your. Uh, uh, you, you can basically get your TensorFlow probability from your stand file. Um, I could probably do it for like our trivial example, and I think I have too um, in the past, and that's that's a good place to start with. Um, so you do that, and then you you know like when you're you you do your priors basically as separate you know uh, separate nodes, and it's kind of like. Um, let me see if I can find the named, joint distribution named, joint distribution named. Yes. So this is the best way to like formulate a model. Like you have, you give it a dictionary of different distribution objects and it just, you know, you could tell it to sample from your entire uh, framework very easily. It's all nicely put together. So I like to have this function with the individual, uh, you know, your individual prior parameters, and then you have one function together that takes all those prior parameters and then gets you your posterior. Um, so, but it's it's very you know very cool, and you know you kind of just move pieces together like Legos. Mm -hmm. um, see, and you got like here you're naming each piece you know, and one can fall into the next. It, it's very cool. So, uh, and it's all enabled with the GPU, TPU stuff, etc. So. Perfect. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. So, you know, so, sometime later, hopefully I'll get like some generally dessert, uh, some stuff like that would use TensorFlow probability for general dissemination. Uh, but right now, the only stuff I have like is for use, using PyStan. So, but they're, you know, they're both really good tools. Yeah, well, thank you for introducing us to us. Yeah, both yeah, yeah, you. my pleasure. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much, Meshik, too. That was really cool uh, you know, to see the CompuCell 3D stuff. <laughs> Any more questions? All right, I guess no. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all. I'll let you all know about uh, Flora know about the GitHub. Yeah, yeah. Send me a link and I'll post it on the uh, GitHub. So I'm gonna stop the recording now.